And there was an important lesson in it for the Guptas and other state capturers and corruptors. Everyone is not corrupt, far from it, nor is everyone corruptible. The Guptas seem to operate on the belief that anyone can be bought, it's just a matter of the price. When I first heard about the amount that the deputy minister had been offered for his cooperation, I was convinced that it had to be a mistake. Six million rand, yes. 60 million rand, maybe, although it seemed unlikely. 600 million rand, impossible. I called Comrade Jonas immediately and he confirmed that this was indeed the case, but they chose the wrong person. Not everyone is corrupt or corruptible. They could have offered him 6 billion rand and the result would have been the same. So we look forward to hearing a message of hope in the keynote address and look forward to your contributions. Be assured you can say whatever you want without fear of incriminating yourselves. You don't have to come up with any preamble before you speak. It's the criminals who live lives with those fears. So I speak on behalf of all board members of the Amat Kathrada Foundation when I say that we are immensely proud of the work done by the foundation under the leadership of our director, Sean, Bol Sean Belton. The anti-racism work, the youth development work, and the pivotal role played by the foundation in mobilizing society against corruption. We have an amazing group of mostly young people working in the organization. Quite appropriate, given that Ahmad Kathrada became politically active when he was just 12 years old. These committed young people, including the younger members of the board, inspire us who are not so young and they give us hope. Once more then, thank you to all of you who have joined us in this event and to all of you who have supported the foundation over the years. Without your support, we, could not, we would not exist or make an impact in the important work of combating racism and fighting corruption. I thank you. Okay, so I wasn't sure if I was expecting someone to sort of introduce me or just jump into it, but it's a pleasure this afternoon to check in with everybody um, for the annual lecture and on behalf of the foundation again to welcome you all. It's with really great pleasure and you know fond memories that um, I'm given the space to introduce the tribute to to Lalu Chiba. And I think that you know even if I were to put the words together, I think others words um, resonate so much more and very quickly before I introduce the speaker. I came across a tweet by Sonny Jacobs, and he said this week in, in memory of, of Lalu Chiba on Twitter, undoubtedly one of the purest human beings I have personally encountered. Um, his dedication to the singular objective of a better life for our people is a testament of leadership. And I think that's a beautiful tribute, but a very fitting tribute. And on that note, to introduce um, Mina Purbu, who really will, I believe, do justice um, and help us really celebrate the memory of Lalu Chiba and the legacy we all hope to continue. Um, thank you for that. Uh, good afternoon, one and all, with all protocols observed. A warm thank you to the Amit Kathrada Foundation and to the family for allowing me to pay tribute to my uncle on what would have been his 90th birthday on the 5th of November. Once upon a time, there was a socialist poet, Pradeep, who wrote a song in Hindi called Pinchare Ke Panchi, which means a cage bird in English. In the second verse of the song, open quote, God wrote your autobiography by dipping his pen in a pot of tears, close quote. So was the case of a noble man fighting for a noble cause. I heard anecdotes of this mysterious man who existed only in my imagination. I eventually got to meet him on Robben Island when I was 18 years old. And there I saw in him a man who was in a cage, but wantonly free in his mind in his outlook and in his ways of being in the world. He embraced life in its fullness, 
He immersed himself wholly in any situation, lived fully in the moment. During the first state of emergency, he used to hold meetings with his comrades in our home. That would determine the fate of our country and which were therefore very important. On many occasions after these meetings, he would engage in a game of chess with my 13 year old brother and would do so with the same measure of passion and significance as he would with his comrades. He would cause himself to lose the game in order for the other to win. This is the thread that wove throughout his life, a selfless human being, generous, brave, honest, and with absolute unconditional regard for, regard for others. He reflected to us how it could look like to be human. On the 11th of November, 2017, as South Africans celebrated the 100th anniversary of the Russian Revolution, I watched my uncle walk into the Workers' Museum to talk on South Africa's socialist tradition. And I wondered, how can one man play so many parts in a single lifetime? Open quote. Let the hour hand reach its timetable in the pure instant and let the people fill the empty streets with fresh and firm dimensions. Here's my tenderness for that time. You'll know it, I have no other flag. Close quote, Pablo Neruda, the victorious people. And to the bravest of them all, Mami. To Kayla, Shkita and Yesh, I would like to thank you all for allowing me space in Mama's life. I am so grateful for the precious moments and the beautiful memories. They will remain etched in the recesses of my memory. Thank you. Thank you so much for that beautiful tribute, that beautiful and heartfelt tribute. Um, I think we all uh, incredibly miss Uncle Isu, especially in uh, times like these where we would have gathered together um, and um, had his lovely encouragement um, and just person with us. I have the great honor of introducing um, the, the topic and the speaker today. My name is Karen Abrahams. I am one of the board members of the Kathrada Foundation. The Kathrada Foundation has a wonderful way um, of designing its public events in a way that is not only timely, but also in a sense ahead of its time. And let me explain what I mean. Um, there are always obviously social, economic and political issues that affect all societies to different intensities and in different ways. And annual lectures, in a sense, always respond to those immediate challenges that are faced by those societies. The Kathara Foundation's leadership has always tended not only to just hone in on those pertinent issues or those challenges, but also to allow us and to push us to think beyond it. The country is watching, I suppose, with great interest and intensity at the Zondo Commission. There's an ongoing activist network seeking to call those involved in COVID procurement-related corruption to account. And while that carries on, our political environment, in a sense, arguably, has never been in such a pessimistic state, a moment where that doesn't have pessimism, gloom, and apathy, but the possibility of hope. And this is a moment for such hope. We are parched. We are parched for voices that allow us to see beyond the current state of affairs, um, to plan, to invigorate the kinds of passion and fortitude as we heard the stalwarts of old did and Uncle Isu did, but also encouraged to know that they are still wonderfully reminded that they are still those who govern and lead, that continue to lead with that kind of passion and fortitude. And as they say, cometh the hour, cometh the man. We are delighted to welcome uh, such a man to engage with us today um, for our annual lecture. Uh, Mr. B.C. Jonas, the former Deputy Minister of Finance. Um, he was born in, in the Eastern Cape um, and 
as a background to his education, is a, is a sociologist and a, and a historian and uh, completed a, a degree in, in education. But he was a born activist, um, as his bio tells us. From the age of 14, he led political activities in PE and launched underground structures in the Eastern Cape. He was inspired by the politics of the Black Consciousness Movement. He played a key role in the UDF structures in the Eastern Cape. And when he returned after a uh, time part of MK and in exile, um, he played a really key role in establishing the structures of the ANC and the SACP in the Eastern Cape. He was then um, asked to serve as, mem as a member of the Provincial Executive Committee in the Eastern Cape, and then served in a number of ministerial functions, uh, de deputy ministerial functions in, in uh, environment, most recently as the deputy finance minister. And his, his book um, that was launched uh, earlier really is, is the kind of uh, testament to where we can get to, someone that is a truth teller, someone that inspires the kind of hope that other people, um, and Sean said earlier, that others find really inspiring to, to then tell their stories. And someone uh, that at that level of, of government, that level of leadership, that can be, uh, that, can, that can hold to integrity, that um, doesn't like to be praised for it because this is um, what public servants are meant to be doing. Um, but we are delighted and honored to, uh, to welcome you, Mr. Jonas, to address us today. And um, we look forward to taking notes uh, and to be, to be schooled um, in, in the kind of politics that we are yearning for. And so with much, without much further ado, we wish you a, a, a wonderful uh, lecture ahead and we welcome you greatly to the Katara Foundation's uh, platform. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for the introduction. Um, let me thank uh, the Katara Foundation for inviting me to give this annual lecture today. I'm always thrilled to listen to Sean and Derek and, and on, the, on the number of occasions that we have engaged. I must also thank Hossi for gladly agreeing to be a respondent to the lecture. The quite a fine and brilliant blind man he is. The title of the lecture obviously is Hope After State Capture Towards an Agenda for Change. I hope by the time I finished, you would have some hope. This lecture, of course, is dedicated to the life and memory of uh, Comrade uh, Lalu Isuchiba, who would have turned 90 this week, as Comrade Chan indicated. Comrade Isu was a very close, almost a lifetime friend of Comrade Kathy, and served as MK commander in a number of uh, levels and functions. And from his release um, until his death uh, in 2017, he remained a tireless champion of non-racialism and human rights. The sacrifices and struggles of our forebearers, such as Comrade Kathy and Comrade Isu, have not only been significantly eroded, but are under direct attack from perpetrators of grand corruption the collapse of the state that these great men and women helped to create, and the rise of nationalist populism. These are the tendencies we must collectively fight against as we build a new consensus around which society must rally. Right now, the US is undergoing a watershed moment with Biden the certain winner in the presidential race against the racist, homophobic, homophobe, Donald Trump, how we got to a situation where a narcissistic right-winger took charge of the world's greatest economic and military powerhouse is something that we need to ponder over. It is something that all democracies need to ponder over. 
It is indeed an understatement that we live in volatile times. The COVID-19 pandemic has accelerated the collapse of the global political and economic system, which has been in place for the past 40 years. The system most commonly referred to as neoliberalism was already approaching the end of its life and has simply been expedited by the unprecedented challenges of 2020. We thought in 2008, with the onset of the financial crisis, that this neoliberal system would have transitioned into something better, something greener, something more humane. Instead, we got what UNTAD in the Trade and Development Report 2020 referred to as a lost, the lost decade. So it is not on just us in South Africa who, has, who have experienced a lost decade, but the whole world experienced the whole um, the lost decade. The period since the Great Recession, the last 10 years, has been characterized by a number of features that have collectively made the developing world wholly unprepared for COVID-19 catastrophe. At the center of the last decade has been rampant financial financialization with declining, declining real investment in fixed capital, driven by a rapacious culture of quick returns to measures and acquisitions, speculative activities, and an over-focus on dividend payments. This was aided by an easing of monetary policies in developed countries contrasted against tighter monetary policies in developing economies. The result has been rocketing inequality, obscene wealth accumulation for global super rich, and a huge uh, increase in foreign currency denominated debt in developing countries. So of course, South Africa was saved from this. Developing countries and private firms took on this debt, this debt assuming output and revenue growth would recover to the levels of the notice. This did not transpire. With the Chinese slowdown, a commodity down cycle from around 2012 has constrained aggregate demand and growth. This has led to growing debt in a number of Latin American and African countries. The onset of COVID-19 of COVID pandemic compounded the situation. Debt servicing obligations, primarily in, the, in developing countries, have seriously weakened their ability to manage the pandemic, meaning that scarce fiscal resources are being directed away from critical health spending and economic relief to focus on debt servicing. More worrying is that these developing countries, with the exception of the, in the main of China and South Asia, do not have the fiscal capacity to stimulate economic recovery and carry out all the interventions that are required. And it is not only governments. Many public and private companies in developing countries also carry high debt and no longer have the balance sheet or risk appetite for investment. Extraordinary economic recovery will be definitely necessary. Global economic contraction as a result of the great lockdown will be between 4% and 5% for 2020. Most developing countries, again, with exception of Asia, will be worst affected. This is especially the case for commodities exporters and tourism economies like South Africa, many of which are experiencing double digit contraction. South Africa's contraction for 2020 is estimated at 7.8%. This will set off a vicious cycle of reduced tax revenue, greater fiscal distress, and ultimately less public investment on health, education, and economic recovery. But this in turn will prolong economic recession in the developing world. And, many mean, and may mean we are in for a long lost decade of austerity, rolling back of services, and growing wealth inequality within and between countries. So what could change this bleak picture? I propose four areas, of course, for that. The firstly, a rapid global bounce back that returns global aggregate demand at least to pre-COVID levels. 
We had hoped this would be the case in the first half of 2021. But with a second wave of infections and consequent lockdowns in Europe, in Europe, this is unlikely. The COVID denialism we have witnessed in some parts of the world is not assisting. Secondly, a Biden victory will go some way towards restoring trade relations between the world's two economic powers. We really need a sustained uptake of Chinese demand for commodities. As a country, South Africa remains dependent on commodities exports as a core source of growth. So Chinese growth, sustained Chinese growth is so crucial for South Africa's economy and the world economy. Thirdly, we need a fresh approach to multilateralism. Again, I hope the Biden victory might be a necessary precondition for this to happen. We must accept that the old multilateral architecture is unfit for purpose, and a new architecture and development approach is necessary to change the global tra trajectory. Fourthly, the world is pivoting towards the necessity of climate change solutions. We need a new impetus to give substance and resourcing for global climate change deal. As a start, Biden has already promised that the US will rejoin the Paris Climate Change Agreement within days of his victory. Indeed, the future of economic recovery and survival is inherently dependent on coherent policy direction on issues such as green energy and water management. The perception that climate change agenda is a nice to have add on to policy is dangerous and probably short-sighted. In addition, we need a global debt deal. I like the proposal currently being advocated by UNTED for the establishment of a new global debt authority, independent of creditors and debtors' interests, and focus on assisting and developing, developing countries with, and for example, sovereign debt restructuring and workout mechanisms. Such an authority could also regulate private hedge and equity funds that are investing in distressed assets. Dealing with debt is a small but necessary part of the global fix. We also need a global economic stimulus and rescue plan directed mostly towards developing countries. Such a global stimulus could direct global liquidity currently pooled in tax havens for example, to green technology, digitization, and health infrastructure in the developing world and Africa in particular. I truly believe that digitization can be a leveler, providing access to new markets, new technologies, providing entrepreneurs with immediate access to networks and know-how. Hopefully the defeat of Trump will deal a blow to the deglobalization lobby. But we also cannot simply return to hyper-globalization model of the past that disproportionately benefited China and finance capital in, developing, in the developing world, in the, in the developed world. A new model for globalization must emerge that conduits foreign direct investment into pro the productive sector of, economy, of developing economies and allow these countries to generate export earnings. This will entail rewriting the rules of global trade to level, to level the playing field. As an alternative measure, we need intellectual property rights on, COVID, on a COVID vaccine waived. Without equitable access to the vaccine, it is highly likely that the global recovery will exacerbate uneven development between developed and developing world. While, global, while a global debt deal would be great, we cannot sit back and wait for that. In fact, if history is anything to go by, such a deal is probably unlikely. We need more global activism around these issues. And it will also be interesting that um, foundations and, and NGOs and civil society and political parties realize that they have to play a role in leading a, group, a global activist uh, initiatives. And we need to get our own house in order in the first instance. Unfortunately, this will take more than coming up with an economic recovery plan. 
or putting new capacity in place in different parts of government. And I'm not, don't get me wrong on this point. These are important measures that we need to support as we do, other, as we do with other reforms aimed at restructuring our dysfunctional state-owned enterprises and tackling endemic corruption. The point though is that these interventions must be underpinned by a much bigger and shared national agenda that accepts as, it, as its starting premise, the nature of the crisis we find ourselves in. Our crisis is not simply a fiscal crisis or a sovereign debt crisis, as many would like make us think. Our crisis is fundamentally a political and economic crisis that will require wide ranging, painful and unprecedented trade off. That will also require bold and strong leadership. In simple terms, we are faced with another 1994 moment, but we now have an opportunity to rewrite the compromises that were made then but which are no longer relevant at all. The 1994 consensus gave us a stable political platform to build a new democracy, assemble a new state architecture and deliver services and welfare to millions of needy South Africa. A small but powerful black elite was created through boardroom deals and access to state rents. This fragile consensus held together for the first two decades of freedom, but has rapidly unraveled since then. A number of factors account for this unraveling. And as I outline those factors, I'll also build in some suggestions about what needs to happen. First, our growth model failed to deliver the output and the revenue required to sustain fiscal redistribution. We remained an economy that's locked into the global economy as commodity exporter without diversifying into sources into other sources of growth this worked well while china was powering forward at a near double digit growth but the plan stumbled on the commodity down cycle that began in 2012 even before the onset of covid we were not producing the required levels of revenue to sustain our social programs. Real spending on health, education, and policy was on the decline. This is set to further decline as we enter the period of fiscal distress, and I believe we are into that period. South Africa was unable to wither the 2008, was able to wither the 2008 Great Recession because we had fiscal reserves and luxury we no longer have. We are close to defaulting on our debt and neither tax increases nor expenditure cuts are feasible. Because sometimes people think that the easy solution is just impose more taxes and taxes can, if not thought too carefully, destroy an economy. And others think that we can just like go into major expenditure cuts. Again, I don't think given conditions that we are in, are, these are all possible. Painful trade-offs and choices are therefore necessary. The question is whether we have the will and leadership. Do we cut public service jobs? Do we freeze public sector wages? Do we cut back on services? How do we balance the interests of public service servants, their unions, and the poor? And what are the interests of the newly established black elite who are so dependent on the state markets as primary source of wealth accumulation? Is there monetary space to play in? And what are the risks, for example, of monetizing debt, uh, monetizing deficit, uh, many people say printing money? How do we bring in private and institu institutional investors to ensure continu continuity on infrastructure spending? How do we deal with ESCOM al albatross around our neck? My own view on this difficult question is that whatever choices are made, the interest of the poor must come first, together with the issues of sustainability. 
We must protect price stability because hyperinflation inflation impacts the poor the most. And if we have to cut posts on services, we must ensure these are not frontline posts. We must reverse the current trend of cutting back on police officers, teachers, nurses, and the like. If we have to cut, it must be at the top. As budgets for procurement shrink, we must open up new opportunities in the real economy for black entrepreneurs. Big capital must come to the party. Business must be active in driving economic reforms. While the structural economic reforms put forward by government are generally accepted as crucial for economic recovery, this cannot be left alone to state, or should I say, to a broken, to a broken state to pursue and implement. This needs to be more active, this need more active involvement from business labor to wrench the economy from perpetual decline. As we accelerate our just in energy transition and open up space for private investment in energy generation, we must ensure that coal dependent communities in Pumalanga are not decimated. Of course, we have to deal with ESCOM debt. We must create active ways to ensure that pro the projected shrinkage in municipal revenue does not sink ESCOM. These difficult challenges are not for ESCOM alone. Our macroeconomic dif dif difficulties are not for Treasury or SAB to resolve either. The whole society, these are whole society issues and they require a leadership that seldom veers towards populist options. Our collective failure to address these issues will sink us all. These times require each one of us to contribute where and how we can. Without this mindset shift and our continued expectation that someone else will do it, we are doomed. The second major failure factor that has caused our consensus to unravel is inequality. It is disturbing that the black share of wealth has not really shifted over the past 25 years. Financial asset inequality has, has a Gini coefficient of 0.92 and property asset inequality is 0.88. Remember that zero represents equality and one represents perfect inequality. There is still racialized elements to this equality. And that's probably what stats show. White South Africans make up more than 60% of the country's elite and Africans only 20%. This plays directly into the unhelpful racial populist narratives, which in turn lead to, to flight of know-how and capital. We cannot afford to become more racially polarized, polarized and divided as society. We need well-considered ideas about how we can deal with inequality scotch in our country. Again, I feel we must look more closely at our growth model. Our unemployment, the small size of SME in the sector, and our failure to build black entrepreneurial class, and our poor education and human capital outcomes, worse, for example, than Zim, have also been a major contributor to the situation we're in. The solution, of course, is far more complex than just direct asset redistribution. This could be one of the measures, but we must ensure that it does not lead to aggregate con contraction in investment and productivity. And of course, it doesn't also prompt up, prompt up the elite. And we have cases where you have asset dis redistribution that essentially consolidates an elite not solve and therefore deepens inequality as opposed to solving the inequality question. At the moment, we cannot afford any more knocks on the, on the economy, on growth and the revenue side. Big capital must get involved in the solutions. We must establish, we must look at things like establishing skills hub, platform for sharing innovation and technology, SMME incubation, banks must come into the party restructure debt and develop fit for purpose financing instruments. 
Business must open up market opportunities in value chains where they are dominant. They must be part of a national, a national project to build inclusivity. The measure of success must be the increased share of black wealth in the markets, increased labor participation and growth. The state must enable this to happen. We also need to create jobs at a scale in the, in the low skills and, and of, the, of the labor market while we transition to higher productivity. Sometimes when we talk about the strategy for jobs in South Africa, I sometimes have a feeling that we, we seem to want to create jobs for skills that we don't have. And if you look at the nature of, the unemploy of unemployment in South Africa, it is a problem of the unskilled or semi-skilled. It is also the problem of, of, of the untrained and uh, sometimes untrainable. So you, you have to create jobs at a scale in the low skills of the labor, in the low skill sec segment of the labor market. We need the state, business, and unions to work together to see how we can improve competitiveness in this segment. Can we think of wage subsidies in labor intensive sectors? Are this feasible? And I'm sure many people will argue they are. And how do we improve our schooling system? Again, I think we cannot just lay the solution at the doorstep of government. Unions and communities must play their role in strengthening school accountability and performance. Business can contribute, particularly in areas like digitization and supporting schools in many other ways. The third trigger of our declining consensus, which I would want to discuss here today, has been state failure, largely as a result of state capture, but I think generally it also adds to all our pushes to state formation since 94. We all had high expectation of the democratic developmental state we established. It was going to drive economic development, to address market failures, and deliver quality basic services to the poor. These expectations have come crashing down with the realization that the state was systematically repurposed for looting. Vital institutions like SARS were destroyed in the process. And NPA, the National Prosecuting Authority and the security cluster became lame ducks, allowing pillaging at levels of the state. Key technocrats and professionals left the employ of the state. Evidence-based planning and budgeting went out of the window. Money's meant for the poor were redirected to networks of corruption. Corruption has also heavily impacted on economic competitiveness, causing huge inefficiencies in critical network industries like transport, logistics, telecoms, and energy. This has driven up the cost of doing business and has lost us investment. Worryingly, the state has lost legitimacy, affecting the leadership role it needs to play in brokering consensus and trade-offs with other constituencies. Of course, we must admit there are clear signs, of course, of restoring governance in, in SOCs and revitalizing SARS and, of course, a lot of work in the security cluster. But let's be frank. The state remains a shadow of its former self. It is still plagued by high levels of mistrust by citizens and key stakeholders in the unions, business, and civil society. Of course, the Zondo Commission and, and its revelation of dirty workings of the state has also added to the lack of credibility of the state. The capacity of, this, of the sphere of government closest to the people, local government remains a real concern. I don't think we are talking enough about this and the catastrophe that awaits many municipalities with likely budget cuts on the horizons and no own, and no own revenue to speak of. We must make sure that services to the indig indigent and, and the maintenance of key assets are protected. I think there has to be a different conversation between different levels of government about how do we rebuild local state in South Africa. And I think we need also to revisit the model. I would like to conclude with some thoughts on political agency, because I believe that we can have all the grand plans and lofty ideas, 
without addressing the question of political agency, we're unlikely to achieve all the things that we aspire to achieve. We've come through a major political transition from a party to democracy, in which the governing party led society through an incredibly difficult process of political and institutional change. The movement was a beacon of hope around which society cohered. In many respects, we are back in 1993. We need to take a new development path and we need a new vision around which society can once again cohere. This time around, unfortunately, we no longer have the same kind of credible and embedded political agency to lead us. Underlying this is the realization that the governing party has not adequately filtered who rises into leadership. Because I think there's something that is unique about political parties, as sometimes we don't recognize, that they, if when they are strong, politically and morally, they're able to filter who rises into leadership. When they are weak and, and morally weak and ethically weak and politically weak, that filtering role disappears. And that is why you would find um, all sorts of characters, all sorts of characters making in the, into, leadership, um, into leadership positions that everybody starts asking, how did it happen? So the filtering role is a, is a function of how strong politically political parties are. I make this point because I think we have to, re, uh, the, 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 the ruling party has to rebuild its own ethical foundation before it can lead a broader campaign for a new moral order in the state and society. And that's fundamentally important because you cannot hope to transform society and deal with this moral and ethical question if the agency itself is questionable at an ethical and moral level. Speaking as I am here today, paying tribute to great leaders like Comrade Cathy, Comrade Isu and others, I must also raise another question. We are also at the moment in our history faced with a challenge that we must move beyond the messiah con complex. And I think our politics generally um, have always been plagued by this messiah complex. And many people will call it the cult of, pers cult of personality, which remained a perpetual feature of our politics. It is unrealistic and frankly delusional to think that a single person can save nations and lead us to a promised land. We were lucky to have golden, a golden generation of leaders like Mandela, Kathy, Isu, and many others. But even they themselves constantly reminded us of the power of the collective and the imperative of building consensus. We must also break out of the belief that what we have in our politics is right now, is good as it gets. Our country has and deserves better. But until we get better, civil society needs to step up and define its role in galvanizing society around a new vision. We need to take initiative as joined up society to begin earnest discussions about the difficult trade-offs and compromises to kick start growth, tackle inequality, and forge common and non-racial future. This is what Comrade Cathy and Comrade Isu would have expected of us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Jonas. Now, I have the honor and the privilege of introducing one of our country's most amazing young minds, a vibrant thinker, academic, and youth leader, Mr. Rikotso Fetse Chikane. He, Chikane is a University of Oxford graduate, a Mandela Road scholar, and has a master's in public policy. He currently is completing a PhD uh, in philosophy at the Wits University and is a lecturer there as well. He was involved in the Roads Must Fall movement and much of this experience was captured in his book that he authored titled Breaking a Rainbow, Building a Nation. Speaking into the politics of the Must Fall movements that have 
taken place over the last few years in the country, and in particular, the change of youth politics. Myself, the many Kathrada youth listening in, as well as all the listeners who have joining, are joining us from around the country, now await your response to the 11th annual lecture delivered by Mr. Jonas. Welcome, Mr. Chikane. No, thank, thanks for that. Um, I just wanna say it is a, it's a huge privilege um, to be at this particular annual lecture um, and a huge privilege to be a respondent to Mr. Mkwebisi Jonas. Um, he's one of those individuals in your country that when I was in the midst of the mid 2000s, when there was a ton of despair, well, you kind of knew there was a problem with the country, um, but you kind of had this feeling that, and I, I, I always use this phrase of, you know, our, our parents almost dropped the ball, right? that we had to kind of look at our parents to essentially ask the question of like, what went wrong underneath your watch, right? As a generation of young people, we grew up in this world of this belief that there's an entire generation that fought against this, this evil system called apartheid, a generation that was able to come out of that and try and build a country. Yet there was this belief that the same generation was almost failing us as, as young people who weren't ready to take over the reins yet, right? You're not ready to take on, you shouldn't have to take on the reins of saving your country as a 15 year old, right? You shouldn't have to bear the responsibility as an 18 year old of, of building a democratic country and pulling it out of its doldrums. So having someone such as WC Jonas stand up and really set into motion a lot of the events that we saw um, of exposing corruption, of exposing the malfeasance within our society, it really gave that hope of, you know, there's, there are people who are still fighting. But what it also gave us is this belief that, you know what, we, even if we are young, right, e even if you are a young first year student who's been told that your only way to get out of your economic situation of poverty and equality is to get your university degree and make something better of yourself and, 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 and assist your family, that your responsibility doesn't end there. Right? It gave that real belief that your responsibility is, regardless of what you might believe, that you shouldn't get involved as a young person in a democratic country to save it from itself. You have to. And, and why I say this, and in this, this, the speech that Mr. Jonas gave really reminded me of this, is that a couple of weeks ago, I woke up in this, this, this panic. And, and the panic was, I feared that my niece would look at me 30 years from now and wonder, you know, what did you guys do to change the country in any particular way? And I didn't believe that I would have an answer for her. And, and I, that fear is still quite dominant in my mind. And, and one of the reasons why I have this fear is that over the past decade, our entire generation is young people, um, because as, as Mr. Jonas talked about, there is this notion of this last decade. I like describing it as over the past decade, my entire generation of young people haven't experienced what an economic boom feels like, right? We, we have no conception of what it means to grow at 3% GDP, right? We, we have no conception of this notion of an economy that is actively contributing to your well-being, right? We have no sense of an economy that is actively combating poverty, inequality, and unemployment. And in a situation like that, it begs the question of, once that boom happens, if it ever happens, is our generation even ready, right? Do we have the skills? Do we have the, um, the, the courage to take on that task of continuing that growth? And, and the fear that I have is that we don't, that we don't have the educational um, experience to take advantage of an economic boom, right? We don't have the capital that is required to take advantage of any sort of economic boom. And it poses this question of whether you, because of this last decade, that you'd be stuck in this cycle. And for me, I think at the core of it, and as Mr. Jonas talked about, and as I mentioned now, is this notion of poverty, inequality, and unemployment. Now, most people would know that all three of these things just haven't changed over the past 20 years, right? So since the end of democracy, we have, we've put a plaster over a gaping wound and told ourselves that we can walk this off, right? Without solving these core problems, as Mr. Jonas highlighted, of poverty, inequality, and unemployment, there's really no point in really going on and discussing anything else. 
And, and the reason why I emphasize this, and I don't want to get too philosophical about it, is that the people who bear the brunt of this are the poorest of the poor, um, and in particular young people, um, and in particular black females who are young as well. But what it really does, right, it's not just that you don't have a job. It's that notion that you exist within a society that strips away your humanity. Right? Uh, Marx would talk about that the way that you, draw, that you gain your sort of humanity is by your, your labor, but you can't do that because you don't bear the fruits of your labor. And Fanon would also say that there's no choice in you ever experiencing a level of consciousness, this level of humanity, if those who are in control don't even recognize you as human. And what South Africa's weirdly done is that we've now conflated both of these things. That if you're young black in our country, that you just won't be recognized as human, right? Yes, yes, yes. These things such as, you know, we have our constitution, which recognizes equal rights across every single individual in the country. We have chapter nine institutions that are created to protect us. We have our beautiful democracy that allows us to take control of our futures if we so wish. But the reality that we see on the ground is that the majority of South Africans have been stripped of their humanity on a daily basis. And the question then becomes of what do you do to reignite that humanity? What do you do to essentially feed someone's sense of well-being? And one of them is to give them a job. Another one is to alleviate their poverty. And another one is to ensure that some sort of inequality disappears. So when I was listening to the speech, I was really trying to figure out when we think about how we recover from this last decade, how do we rebuild the humanity of young people, of South Africans in general? People who have lost hope, people who have got no sense of what a better world will look like. Right? We, will, we always get confused by, uh, by sporting events. <laughs> sporting events often cloud our judgment at times. It gives us a momentary moment of reprieve to believe that our society is functioning well, but once that sporting event dies out, we then see the, the vast disparities at, at our helm. So in my mind, I've got a few recommendations of how we rebuild this notion of humanity within our society, and it's based off the lecture that we just heard. So at the core of it, I think we should not throw away this notion of GDP, um, GDP growth or growth or economic growth models, right? Not to say that these aren't important, right? Not to say that financial markets aren't important, but it's to ask the question what your end goal is. And, and I'd be very interested to hear Mr. Jonas's notion of, can you find a new index of growth within the country that focuses solely on alleviating poverty, inequality, and unemployment, right? That the financial market's success should be based off the ability to get rid of this triple threat, right? That any sort of infrastructure development should be focused on how you get rid of this triple debt. So that when the president gives us his state of the nation address, right, he isn't telling us, he or she won't be telling us about our target is to get 1% GDP growth. The real focus should be our target is to reduce poverty, inequality, and unemployment by this amount over the next five years. And that is the target that you should hold us to. I think that should be a reimagining. I also think we need to rethink this notion of, fiscus, um, of, fis of fiscal packages, rather. Um, as Mr. Jonas had talked about, you know, we really need to rethink how the global markets function. We need to think about how we handle debt within our countries that uh, because we don't have the fiscal reserves and because, as he eloquently explained, that the majority of our society is now built on this notion of debt servicing as a developing country, that we really need to rethink the notion of what kind of fiscal stimulus do we have. And some of these things might sound a bit controversial, and I hope it's not too much, but it is a response, so I'll take a bit of liberty here. And the first one is, I think we should really rethink this notion of infrastructure investment. Infrastructure investment has not helped our country. Maybe it has kept us on a stable footing in the mid-2000s, but ever since 2011, there's been no real impact of in infrastructure investment. And, and this notion of infrastructure investment is this idea of building roads, right? <laughs> building roads, building infrastructure of the country. And I think there needs to be a tweaking of that idea because often the notion of infrastructure investment is linked to this idea of it will create job opportunities. Now, the, the notion of job opportunities is the bane of my existence. Um, no one really talked about job opportunities before 2014. Before 2014, it was about creating jobs. 
Um, and then something happened within the discourse of economic development in our country, but it's changed towards job opportunities. This idea of you've got the opportunity to work. Right, you, you have the opportunity to exist within your country as a human being, right? That you can live a life that you deem valuable to live, right? And I think we need to strip this idea of infrastructure development being linked to job opportunities. And, and, and that really needs a complete reconceptualization of what it means to work within our country. I might disagree with the notion of a wage subsidy. I think it's fundamentally linked to this idea again of, of job opportunities, this, this idea that I will pay a private company an X amount as the state to encourage them to give a young person a six month opportunity within their workplace. And what we've seen that the system has done is that it creates a revolving door for young people um, within that, that middle income area, essentially. People who are trying to knock on the door of becoming middle income. And middle income in South Africa um, is essentially anyone who's earning about 22,000 to 28,000, you're about middle income. Right, but you're right there, <laughs> right? You're, you're paycheck away from dropping back down into being low income. But this idea that giving someone that, that six month opportunity to earn 5,000 Rand a month, right? And then after the six months ends, that then your job finishes and then you must look for another opportunity to work. And obviously this needs us to improve education within the country. It needs us to fix the, the, the demand and supply mismatch that we have within our labor market. But the drive of the demand and supply mismatch is through our failure to reimagine what the workplace should look like for young South Africans. And I think I agree with Mr. Jonas in the sense of we need to rethink what low skills looks like. And, and low skills doesn't mean low pay. There's this false equivalence between the two, right? Low skills shouldn't mean low pay, right? Low skills essentially says, as a country, we have failed to educate you in one way or another because our educational system has failed. But that doesn't mean that you can't have a job that you deem worth um, working towards, that you have a clear path of advancement, that the job that you have should have a clear plan of what do you do for the next three years. And I think the plan should be focused on that. And I think once you solve that problem, you then really speak to the real structural issues of unemployment. Uh, so I agree with that notion of low, of low skills and rethinking what low skills looks like. I fundamentally agree with the notion that global trade and the global markets are biased towards our country, right? And they're biased against, um, not towards, they're biased against the country such as ours. They are biased against the developing world. But the worst thing, what is even worse than that is the acceptance of that status quo, right? When we were talking yesterday with Mr. Jonas, he was describing to me this notion around how South Africa is this huge, huge, distributor and miner of platinum within the world, right? One of the largest contributors of platinum to the world, yet we have absolutely no say on the price of platinum, right? That, that there's, there's a fundamental mismatch there, right? We don't have to accept the notion that within global trade that we will always be a loser. And where we win is in very small sectors and where we win, we get very small returns. And that kind of takes a, a political courage at a national level, and we'll get to that just now, but it takes a level of political courage. So I really think there is this desperate need, and I agree fully that this notion of reestablishing what global trade, global markets, global finance markets in particular look like is extremely important. But what's even more important is not accepting your fate. And as a generation of young people, they needs to we need to create that courage of knowing when you're stuck in the status quo, because often we don't even realize we're stuck in the status quo. And then figuring out what are the tools that are necessary to pull you out of that situation? What are new ways of reimagining the economy? What are the new financial tools that you can utilize that move you from a space of accepting your fate as a loser within the global markets, but accepting a realization that you could actually be a winner? I think there's one point that, that I think was missing from the speech, and I, and I don't mean it in a negative way in any sense, but, but the notion of, of social welfare within our country, again, might be slightly controversial, and I don't want to poke too many bears, but I think there's a deep need to reduce the amount of people on social welfare. It's another target that we need to reimagine. Uh, our current government has this preoccupation with this, if we can't fix the country, just hand out more money. And I have no issues with that because people need that type of income, 
right? Social grants within our country are the livelihood of people's lives. Without them, our country will fall apart. But there also has to be a concerted effort of understanding that we need to reduce the amount of people on social welfare, not because we're reducing the amount of grants, but because we've created an economy that has allowed people not to need them, right? That is allowing your economy and the people within your economy to be living a life where receiving a social welfare grant of any sort is not a requirement. And we were caught sleeping at the wheel. COVID-19 exposed us all to this. They should have never been a need of sorts for COVID-19 grant at the size that it was if your country was fully functioning, right? And, and we shouldn't get too confused by what other countries have done. Um, their large fiscal reserves allow them to do the things that they can do. But within a country such as ours, with the limited resources we have, if we lived in a country that didn't have the kind of unemployment, poverty, and inequality that we have, a COVID-19 grant of that sort wouldn't be necessary. The bigger fault is that even though we had this COVID-19 grant, we didn't even know who to give it to. We had no sense of how to give money to the informal sector, right? Those with low skills, supposedly. And I think we really need to think about a smart and equitable welfare system within our country, a reimagining of it that helps the individuals who need it the most, but also actively works towards making sure that someone doesn't require one over the span of 10 years. I, I love the point on, on political agency, and it'll be one of the last points that I make. Um, I was in, was in a meeting a couple of years ago where someone enlightened me. So my dad, um, for those who don't know, my dad always says that, you know, in South Africa, it, or, or the whole world is corrupt. There's nothing wrong. Like the whole world is corrupt. South Africa is not unique in that sense, except in South Africa, if you give someone a million rand to build a road, right? The rest of the world, their corruption is that they'll steal 100,000 rand and then build a 900,000 rand road. In South Africa, for whatever reason, the person will steal 900,000 rand and then build a really bad 100,000 rand road. But the problem then becomes that that person who's stolen gets given, essentially, that contract again. And I think the fault of that, this, this notion of corruption, is that often people think about corruption in our country as the sum of parts. But if you remove these particular individuals who are causing corruption in the eyes of the public, therefore you deal with corruption. And my approach is that I think corruption is more of an emergent property. I think it is something that has fundamentally evolved over time. I think it is something that you cannot distill it to individual activities, right? Simply removing one, and I, I guess we, we can't use names here, but simply removing one person Right, doesn't solve the problem of corruption because it has evolved into something that is more than the sum of its parts. And once we start understanding corruption that way, we can then have a conversation about what are the positive feedback loops that drive the constant evolution of this corruption and then start devising the type of institutions that create negative feedback loops that essentially reduce that amount of corruption. And I think that's a way of dealing with this question. It's still it's something that you kind of need to wrap your head around it, but simply removing people who are stealing from the state does not solve corruption in a country such as ours, where corruption has evolved into the fiber of our country. I also think there's been a desperate disconnection between political power and localized activities. For I, I don't know when this happened, but for whatever reason, we've created this notion within our country and this speaks to this idea of reimagining politics and reimagining political agency. For whatever reason, there's been a disconnect between political power, so the idea that you have some sort of political influence and the work that you do on the ground. That somehow that these two things are no longer connected within our country. For the longest time during the apartheid fights, during the early 2000s, your political strength came from the activities that you do within your communities. Now we don't have that anymore our political organizations and the ruling party in particular has fundamentally lost that connection. Uh, I, I, if, I, if I'm allowed to be blunt, a, a branch of the ANC in particular gains its power by the amount of people in the room and the discussions that it has, but it doesn't gain its power by the work and the community service that it does in its communities. And I think that isn't alone with the ANC. I think it's a broader problem that we have. And civil society is extremely important in trying to bring that, that divide. 
right? So when I think about how you reimagine civil society, I think there's one fault that civil society has to get over before it can reimagine. And I think it's the notion that the way that you used to organize in the past is the way that you should organize now, right? That, that model is fundamentally changed. As we've seen over the past decade, the amount of youth protests that have happened across the world are fundamentally different than they were 30 years ago. But the impacts that they've had on society are fundamentally changing our societies as well. And they all use the same strategy and tactics and they're sharing knowledge, whether this is the Arab Spring, whether this is Black Lives Matter, whether this is Fees Must Fall, whether these are the protests in Sudan, the tactics, the knowledge sharing between these organizations is a clear indication of how civil society has evolved in the 21st century. And I think for civil society to be able to bridge that gap between political power and localized activities and communities, they need to reimagine themselves within that system and update the way that they mobilize. I fully agree with this notion of a messiah complex. I don't, and oddly enough, uh, Mr. Jonas, I think you've become a messiah in the eyes of many people as well. Um, and one of the lessons that we learned from Fees Must Fall, very, very stark lesson is that we didn't want to have messiahs. There would be one, there would be no one face of this movement, right? And yes, there's a whole bunch of social media that promoted particular individuals, et cetera, et cetera. But there was a very concerted effort from our generation to say, we will not have one messiah who saves us because if that messiah falls, right? If they falter, the entire movement falls that again, your, your political activity shouldn't be linked to a individual who has some sort of influence. That your political activity should be linked to the work that you do as society within your communities. So my biggest takeaway from, from this lecture is that I think they still hope. <laughs> and I believe that they still hope. And I believe that individuals like Mkwebisi Jonas are the type of individuals that we need within our country to keep inspiring us to keep growing that growth. And more importantly, the legacies of individuals like Ahmad Kafada are the type of legacies that remind us about how hard the journey is for change. That a revolution won't solve everything overnight. That change is hard fought over decades. And the question that you have to ask yourself, especially if you're a young person who's listened to this lecture, is are you willing to take on that change? And again, I, I do want to thank you, Mr. Jonas, for for not taking that 600 million rand and going off to the Bahamas or Monaco or wherever it was. Because I truly believe that because of your actions, you set in motion a set of dominoes. And I appreciate the work that you're continuing to do. And I wish you well as well. Thank you so much. Thanks, Khotse. Um Thanks, Khotse, so much for that. Um, and, and more so for rejecting the idea of a of, of us needing a messiah, but also recognizing, I think, the importance of the stance that Mkabisi had taken and how that could easily have catapulted him into that messiah kind of role had he chosen to go in, in, in that direction. So, friends, comrades, we, we are at a point where with this technology, it's very difficult to allow everybody to just speak, which is why we've asked for comments on the chat line. But what we've agreed with Kristen, should anybody want to make a 90 second contribution, you need to raise your hand. Um, if you raise your hand, we should be able to see you and I will acknowledge you and we will unmute you to make your comment for 60 or, or 90 seconds. Uh, let's see who's brave enough, who wants to make use of this opportunity. Uh, no hands, no hands, no hands. Uh, other than I think the, the huge applause that has been given to both speakers, uh, no, nobody has any comments to no, nobody wants to, to to raise directly Irfan you want to come in Irfan I have acknowledged you um, okay Irfan break the ice um, 
good afternoon, everybody. I'm here with um, some youth, and we have one of our young people from the Temple Ishle Youth Club would like to make a comment. Greetings, honorable um, comrades and fellow citizens. Uh, actually, I want to make a point. The Court of Fate has been mentioning many points, many valid points that I've been listening to, and he is on point especially when it comes to the employment part. We are getting employment parts whereby we're only getting temporal uh, contracts for six months. And then afterwards, what happens to those individuals? My proposal was, why not get those stakeholders or businesses to build factories in a local area for, for that factory to be there permanently, supplying the uh, product or service that is high in demand? in order to eradicate the unemployment rate. And um, getting back to uh, Mr. Mr. Jonas, he was mentioning, mentioning a lot of things that are important, but there are some of the things that I haven't heard, even the whole country hasn't been paying attention to it. Maybe it's because of the pandemic and stuff. When Ramaphosa, my, my president, first came into into power being a president as he is right now. He was making regular visits to China uh, and abroad, going to make some investments, but it's not clear whether those return on investments uh, have, been, have been returning to us. Uh, it's not clear at all. So those are some of the things that we need to look at as a country. That will Good. be all for Thank me. you so much. Thank you for that. Uh, Irfan, you can lower your hand. Can I take two more contributions? Anybody else wants to come on board? Any other hand? No? Uh, and you see, you, you've listened to Kotsi's response. Um, and, and you've listened to, 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 to the issue that this young person has raised um, and also being an, inv an investment envoy for the country, you perhaps want to reflect on just some of the lessons learned from, from being an investment envoy in this environment and, and then link to, come back to some of the, 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 the issues that uh, Hotsi has raised um, and, and, and some of the I think guarded critique that 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 that, that is made about your, your your presentations. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mission. Um, Jose, I think um, thank you for the response. I think I'm always um, I must say that impressed by uh, the freshness of your thinking in, on many of the issues. I mean, uh, I think you should keep up that. And just listening to you, I mean, it tells me that there is hope, I mean, at least away from the bombastic youth uh, linked to political parties. Uh, the first point I wanted to respond to, I think the, 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 the issue about you raised, um, I agree with most of your points. I'll just pick up on the areas where I thought you were raising. The issue about infrastructure investment, I, I think part of the challenge we have, and I would really ask that, you can't look at infrastructure investment in isolation. So in a, in a sense, in many ways, that how you kind of uh, scale up or scales down your infrastructure investment should also be linked with your whole growth model as a whole. And, 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 and I think that's something that I think uh, the discussion sometimes gets disjointed because there's no broader discussion on the growth model. And then we talk about infrastructure and, and that's why, in, in general terms, you would find that in, infrastructure tends to be very, um, if you take, think, look at it from the contribution to uh, sustainable employment and other things like that, you might not see. But until you look at the, at, at the, at the kind of holistically, the growth strategy. I'll leave it there, but I'm saying that's probably where the, the, um, the conundrum happens. The second, I, I think the second point that I would make is that on, the, on this thing about um, the point I was making about how do you kind of stimulate um, a labor intensive industry? I, I'm, I'm a firm believer on the point, I must say upfront, that 
if you look at the nature of unemployment, where we have become so uncompetitive in labor intensive sectors of the economy as a country. And, and you can explain that in all sorts of ways, but generally I think we, we do need to reimagine how we look at um, stimulating growth of labor intensive industry. And I'm saying this thing because it's an important transitional me mechanism amongst other things, because as you make your intervention in education and other things, then we actually start becoming competitive in different at a different level also, and therefore we solve the problem. But fundamentally, the problem of unemployment is that it remains the problem of the unskilled and low skills. And therefore you can't say that you would develop jobs for skills you don't have. And there's a big measure of our intervention must respond to the immediate challenge. And I find ourselves, I think, in many ways, as we become less competitive in the, in the labor intensive sectors and in our failure to improve labor intensity of our economy stems from the fact that I don't think sometimes we, we, we take this seriously. Now, it could be, and again, I'm raising it, it could be um, all sorts of incentives and support. It could be wage subsidies, could be all sorts of things that you could do. It could be infrastructure support for industry growth, etc. So I'm talking about stimulating what a couple of years ago was fundamentally very thriving in South Africa, uh, but we gradually lost the competitive edge in those, in those areas. But I could, we could have the discussion more, but I think how do you do it is a big, it's a big question, of course, I would argue. The second part, I mean, the, the, I, I probably I, uh, the, the, the issue about um, the social wage, again, I think, if, if again, if you look at the way we've, we've actually moved into that, it was a necessary intervention, by the way. I think we've, we've managed in South Africa in many ways, and I know that people don't believe that. We've actually managed to um, almost reduce um, absolute poverty uh, just through this, this system of social welfare, et cetera, et cetera. And I mean, if you look at countries like Malaysia, it took like 15 year, 50 years to deal with, with um, um, uh, absolute poverty. And there was a study done by World Bank, and, and it, it actually kind of outlines how effective uh, the system has been, and so on and so on. Again, you cannot look at the measure as, and that's always my fear, you cannot look at the measure as the absolute intervention and an end in itself, if you do not have other aspect of your strategic care. And I, the, the way I see the problem that we have, I think we gradually becoming issue oriented as a country. And sometimes we look at each aspect of our intervention in isolation with others. And there's no kind of grand uh, plan that we all subscribe to and, and understand where it's going and how you kind of gradually reduce dependence on grants as you improve employment, etc. cetera. So that, that's broadly, again, back to the issue that I raised at uh, the issue of strategy, because I still think that it's, uh, I agree with the comments you make on, on uh, the political agency, but I still believe that the debate in South Africa has to focus on political agency. The political agency will continue to undermine most of the things that we, we're talking about and the possibility for reimagining society, reimagining our economy, etc. Sometimes when we talk about our political parties, we talk about political parties in our head, not the actually existing uh, political parties. I think the debate is about the actually existing ANC, not the ANC in our minds or in our memory. And it's the actually existing ANC it has to be up to the task. And, 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 and that's, I think, something else that when you look at what you have, and I think it's a debate that I think, because I think you must also understand that the use of the word movement was not accidental. It was, a, it was based on an understanding that the struggle for liberation is a broad multi-class and, and, and multi-sectoral struggle that involves all sectors and classes of society. And it, all, it happened behind, um, at a particular point behind the organizational formation called the ANC. The movement part, I think, is something that we must constantly go back to. It actually talks to a front in, in, in the sense where society 
has a stake in what happens and defines what happens. And that's, I think, what we have lost um, in, the, in the last couple of years. Of course, the other thing that we've lost is that if you are a liberation movement, I always maintain that you define morality, you define ethics, because you are a liberator, you're providing liberation of the masses. I think once you become a governing party, it turns around because you're not just a liberator. You have to have morality defined by society at large and, and et cetera. And that the relationship of accountability, et cetera, changes. And it's some debate that I think we should continue to have uh, as a country. And responding to the last question, I think I've responded to the factory issue. I, I think the, 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 the environment in the last uh, couple of years has been globally for investment and investment flows has been difficult. But it's also been made difficult, I think, by a number of other factors. I think the fact that I think you, you to attract investment, you also need some kind of growth narrative. And, and people, I mean, invest in economies based on how they are attracted to the growth story that we articulate as a trend. And I must say that we must all admit that our growth narrative has generally been weak. So the impact that we could have had, we did not. And the rate at which we have actually dealt with some of the regulatory bottlenecks and, and uh, dealing with the corruption issues, we've been pretty much slow in dealing with those things. That has a direct impact on our performance. Having said that, I think there's been a lot of um, a new investment in, in, in different sectors, in the automotive sector, et cetera, et cetera. But the scale of what we have achieved is not actually kind of um, in tandem with the, with the challenge that we face in unemployment and joblessness and even growth. So something needs to happen around revisiting the whole model for growth and et cetera in the country. Thanks. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you so much. I, I'm, I'm, uh, I just want to acknowledge um, so William, the brain of today, Hogan, uh, John has now left, uh, Eleanor Sisulu amongst us, and uh, Ravin Godan. Now I'm going to impose on PG to say a few words, uh, g given that this is an area that he has a huge amount of interest in. Um, PG, over to you, a couple of comments from your side, and then we'll wrap up at least this part of the program before we go into the penultimate item. Over to you, Praveen. And greetings to Axis Sulu as well. Kristen, unmute PG. Shan, he is unmuted. Uh, Minister of Godan, just try to speak again. Can't hear you, PG. Uh, but we can't hear. Okay, wait, I'll ask you again. Just accept. Okay, you can speak now. No, we, we can't hear you at all. Can you can you try again? Try. No, uh, I think there must be something wrong on Minister Godan's uh, audio. Sorry, Sean. Somebody has finally managed to keep you quiet, uh, PG. <laughs> oh, man. Um, okay, I, I'm not sure um, what the problem is. Let's try uh, just one more time. Uh, Minister Godan, I'm going to ask you to unmute again. Okay, you can try to speak now. No, it's not working at all from your side. I'm not sure why. Sorry, Sean. Okay, Kristen, let's leave it at that. Uh, so something significant happened there. Um, for the first time, somebody was able to keep PG from talking. Um, 
and, and we really wanted to get his contributions to this. But nevertheless, I, I, I think that this, we will get the papers out. The uh, paper will be out, um, hopefully by the end of this meeting. And we will get Hotsi's response as well. Ned, we're moving on. Uh, apologies for that. I, I want to now just call on Busi Siwe and Kosi, the head of our anti-racism program, to just announce the details around the 2020 anti-racism award. Uh, over to you, Busi, and then we'll come back to, to con make the concluding remarks. Busi? Good, e good afternoon to everybody. Um, my name is Busi Wengosi Asian. Um, it is a privilege for me to present uh, the Amit Katrada Foundation Anti-Racism Award 2020. Uh, yearly an individual or an organization who has tackled racism is selected for the accolade. Previous winners have included Reverend Solomon's Mabuza for calling out racist action of fellow flight passenger who used the K word in a text reportedly describing the pilot and other two passengers. We've also had Constable Clement David Mukondo, a police officer who bravely acted against an incident of racism. Um, and then we've also had Chester Missing, um, the puppet who, whose work goes a long way in actually tackling and speaking about racism. Um, this year's winner is an individual whose own life history comes from the police force back in 1975. He calls himself a reformed racist who continually owns up and challenges his own privilege. He is awarded for his ongoing work in tackling racism and is the founder of People Against Racism PA, which offers legal support to individuals seeking justice. The cases pursued by Pa are taken on pro bono basis, and he goes by the name of Drikas Fiedemann. Um, Drikas has been on the receiving end of threats against his life from those discouraging him from the work that he does. The threats have mostly been via Twitter, SMS, phone calls, and from those who want to just stop him from speaking out against racism and from assisting uh, victims of racism. He's lost friends, family, due to the stars, but remains a thorn on the side of right-wing races. Drikas is an advocate of anti-racism doing progressive work in South Africa. Unfortunately, he could not join us today due to ill health, but we congratulate him. And at the same time, we ask for everyone in society to be our voices when it comes to combating and speaking out against racism. Thank you. Thanks, Busi. Um, and, and thanks for all the work that you do uh, and continue to do to build the anti-racism movement. Thanks as well to Kristen Zakira for the work around strengthening democracy, uh, tackling state capture, tackling corruption in this country, Irfan and the team around the youth activism program, uh, Shaida and Ismail on the history work that, that you continue to do. And on that note, the, the foundation really appeals to all of you who can to assist to make a contribution to, 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 to keep it functional, to keep it being a voice uh, and having a grassroots presence at this point in eight communities uh, in the south of Joburg, which will be expanding to about 20 more in 2021. Uh, this year, we played a key role in uh, responding to the COVID-19 crisis, setting up the community action network across Gauteng, um, being, being a huge uh, role player in, in, in uh, COVID-19 corruption campaigns, um, and, and work that we will continue well into next year. But support of any kind is always welcome, uh, particularly financials, those of you who can, please give us a call. Those of you who want to talk more about possibilities of supporting the foundation, uh, just, just indicate and, and, and we will make the necessary calls and come and have the necessary discussions. Um, so the, 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 in, in the upcoming weeks, uh, we will be ten looking at the 
appearance of the former president at the Zondo Commission on the 16th of November. On December 8th, we will mark the death anniversary of Lalu Chiba with the unveiling of a memorial stone for uh, Reggie, uh, Shirish and Indres and, and pay tribute to them at West Park Cemetery um, as well as launch the 2021 calendar uh, on site. This will be our last sort of public and open public event for the year. Um, in, in the meantime, there's a number of seminars, webinars and other events from the foundation that you should be on the lookout for. And I am requested now to uh, try PG one more time. Um, Kristen, do we do, do you you want to go down there or do we just want to 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 conclude? Can we try PG for 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 some remark for the very last time? No. Uh, if not, okay, no, I can't. No, we're fine. Let, let, let's conclude. Just to thank the board members of the foundation for, for your presence here and for the continued support uh, to this foundation. Uh, we, we really live to, to, to carry forward the legacy of people like Lalu and, and, and Kathrada in all that we do on a day to day basis, but we can't do it without the support. Uh, and visible support of a board that we really have some of the most credible, amazing people who stand guard and all of his compatriots. Um, so on that note, thanks to everybody. Thanks for your presence. Uh, and this lecture has ended way before time. Uh, our media team, Zinzi and Delani, huge, huge congratulations for getting this out today getting it up live today on, on, on a number of, of TV stations as well. What you do is beyond incredible. Um, and, and it's a staff that we really ch cherish and it's a staff that we have grown up, uh, you have grown up in this foundation uh, and, and, and we really value all, all of your amazing contributions to taking forward the legacy of Ahmed Kathara. So on that note, thank you. Please be safe, be COVID free until the next AKF event. Thank you. Bye.